series about the Midot, various characteristics, strengths, and weaknesses which we all have, and what we can do about them, how we can work on them. A very important part of a Jew's life on a daily basis is working on himself, refining his character, being a better person, being a better husband, a better father, a better friend. All of that is very, very important because it will determine what kind of a life we will have, the tone of our life. Of course, performance of mitzvot is very important. That is our obligation, our duty as Jews, to do Hashem's will. But in interacting with people, and in being able to deal with life as a whole, it's important that we have the right outlook. And midot, character, is a very important part of whether one succeeds or fails in his mission in life. And we've been covering already various midot, various characteristics, and it's not easy. We first need to identify them. We have to admit that we may have a certain area that we need to work on. So there are other issues that need to be resolved before one can face the problem. But I'm assuming that we all are truthful with ourselves, and if we identify something in ourselves, hopefully we will make the decision to take steps and, and work on them. Atzlut, laziness, is spoken a lot about in Mishlei. Shalomo Melech, who wrote Mishlei and Kohelet, speaks a lot about this terrible midah, this midah that really is very, very destructive. And there's various pesukim, various uh, verses where he describes in detail what happens to this man as a result of his laziness. I'm going to just start with one as an example because it's a typical example of what happens, the consequences of laziness and how one on the outside can actually observe someone's home and know that the owners are lazy or perhaps lazy. And this is how he begins the Pasuk in Perek Chavdalet of Mishle. I was passing by the field of a lazy individual. And I was going by the vineyard of one who is Chasar Lev, who has no heart. And that's another way of describing someone who does not take life seriously, who's not intelligent who does not take the time to understand what's important. He's chasar lev, he's without a heart, without sechel. And how did he make this determination that we're dealing with somebody like that? This field obviously belongs to someone, and somehow it's been neglected. It's full of weeds, kasupanav harulim, there are thorns growing all over the place. Vigeder avanav neherasa, and the fence that is supposed to protect it, to encircle it, has fallen in disrepair. It's broken. What a shame. It is obviously noticeable that this place hasn't been taken care of, its owner doesn't care, or he's simply lazy. And as a result of his laziness, it becomes apparent that he's unwilling not that he's un not capable, but in this case, he's unwilling to take care of his place, a field, a field that has potential, a field where you can grow things. And look how it looks. And everybody can tell. You go through gardens here, you're able to see if they have a gardener, if somebody's taking care of it. Perhaps the house has been abandoned. You can tell a lot by how it's being taken care of. Another pasuk in Kohelet. Kohelet says in Perek Yud, chapter 10, Ba'atzaltan yimacha mekare u'b'shiflut yadayim idlof habayit. Similar idea, the two parts of the verse. Ba'atzaltan yimacha mekare means because of laziness, the roof will become weakened. He doesn't take care of the roof. He continuously rains on it doesn't fix it. So because of this laziness, because of his not putting an effort to repair what needs to be repaired, slowly but surely that roof will fall apart. Because of, let's call it procrastination, 
the leaks will begin to come, drop by drop by drop. Again, similar idea as a result of neglect, of not take care, taking care of things, things will become worse and worse with time. This midah, atzla, atzlut or atzlanut, is destructive not only in olam hazeh, in this world, where one sees the consequences, where one can lose money, lose a job. Not only is it observable here, but it also affects his olam haba. One who's lazy will not perform, will not fulfill mitzvot. It works both ways. It's not that he's lazy necessarily just in one area. Because of his laziness, all his life is affected. Why is this such a, a critical midah? Because we are in the olam asiyah. After all, we are in the world of action. According to the Kabbalah, this is the physical world, the world where we act. We need to perform. The world of performance, where we fulfill certain things. The Jew, besides performing as an ordinary human being in working, as the Torah says, Beziata pecha tocha lechem, we have no choice but to work for our living. But besides that performance in the physical <coughs> world, he has his own duties with Hashem. He has what's called avodat abore, his service with Hashem. He also, on top of his physical work and labor and uh, profession, needs to work with the mitzvot, with the Torah. That is part of our life. And every Jew, every individual also has his unique mission to accomplish. So this is something to take seriously. In other words, it may actually happen that some, someone may actually sleep through his life. And before you know it, it's all over and nothing has been done and nothing has been accomplished. There's a saying in Hebrew, and I'm sure it's in other saying too, it's in Arabic. Yeah? Some people like to say that you know, life is about work, work is our life, but not for us. You know? But it is for you, it is for us. It's not only something that we have no choice in the, in, the, in the matter, it is actually something healthy, as we will soon see, when I will elaborate about the importance of being occupied. So it's not just a necessity, it's also healthy. Rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avot, in speaking about life, they remind us that Rabbi Tarfon Omer Hayom Katsar da Melacha Meruba. The day is short, life is short, and there's a lot of work to be done. But for some reason, people tend to be lazy. And why should they be? There's so much reward and compensation for just working, for doing what we're supposed to do, the mitzvot. And the boss is pushing and encouraging and reminding us, get to work. Time is short. Before you know it, it's all over. You don't have that much time, and there's so much to accomplish. But for some reason, people are lazy. Now, when we talk about laziness, I'm going to, I'm going to show you that there's various forms of it. Even though it's all called laziness, there's actually various types. Some more, some less, some more serious, and so forth. One aspect of laziness is actually called procrastination. You, does everybody here know what that word means, procrastination, or as it's called in Hebrew, lithot, dechia, to push something off, to delay something. That is also a form of laziness, because laziness has various faces, various facets. Let me give you a quick example of four types or four levels of laziness that some of us may have only one, some may have the second, some may have the third. Somebody wants to write a letter, okay? An important letter, obviously, he wants to get it done with. He procrastinates, he pushes it off for whatever reason. He never gets around to it. Now, this could, doesn't have to be a letter, it could be anything else. But you will see why I chose letter. This happens, it happens to a lot of us. Then there is someone who doesn't have a problem putting the letter together. He's a quick typist, <laughs> or whatever. He gets it done, but that's where it stops. After he's finished writing his letter, 
it takes him forever to find a, an envelope and a stamp. He just doesn't find it readily. It's not around. He pushes it off. He has written his letter. It's ready. Send it off. All you need is an envelope and a stamp. It takes just forever to find that. So he's overcome the first stage of laziness. He's written the letter, but he's not getting it done. I mean, it's not finished. Then you have the individual who wrote the letter, found the envelope in the stamp. What does he need now? He needs an address. Now, for the address, you have to sometimes make a phone call. You have to sometimes look for it in the yellow pages, and the internet, and the books, and whatever. Somehow, he can't get himself to that stage. He's been OK with writing the letter. He was quick enough to find an envelope and a stamp, all happy and proud of himself. But now he has to go search for an address, so he's procrastinating and pushing it off, and that letter is not being sent. Then you have the guy who's found the address, he's all okay about this. So he's written the letter, put the letter in the envelope, put a stamp on it, put the address on after he looked for it. And what's his problem? He's lazy, doesn't want to go to the post office, to the mailbox. And it's funny, but it's true. You know, different stages of laziness. He was able to do this, able to do that. Finally, ah, just puts it aside. When is he going to go? Well, mañana, you know, whenever. Whenever I'll get to it. You see, he was able to overcome what for other people would be hard. Writing the letter is the hardest one of all. This is the easiest. Just go and drop it in the mailbox. Ah, I don't feel like it. It's a little cold outside. Put on a sweater. Do some, you know, come on. That is... That is where he is stuck. And people are stuck in different stages. Some in the early, they can't get their, themselves to write a letter. Others finding that address. <laughs> and others just sending it to the mailbox. And it's, it, what a shame. The whole thing is done. It's practically done. All you need is just one little more effort. And obviously what we're going to be doing here is trying to analyze where does this come from and how to deal with it. It would be not enough for me just to talk about the problem, the symptom, and not to give you ideas. But I want to remind you that it's, it's, it's unfortunate that this particular midah in various degrees affects many, many, many of us. Let me give you an example of the worst kind of, uh, of laziness, which is in Mishle again. And this is the individual who has an excuse for everything. Very famous example that is quoted about how lazy can you really get? Right, Yishacham Beinav. That actually is a different uh, verse. The, the, it's the next verse after that. Amar Atzel Shachal Badarech. What does a lazy man say? I don't want to go to the Shi'ur. I don't want to go see this great rabbi who's coming. Why? There is a lion in the street. They tell him, you don't have to go too far. He's in town. You know, just across the street. So he says, Ari ben No, there's probably going to be problems here too. There's probably a lion close by. They tell him, you know what, you just have to go next door. You don't even have to go outside. The door swings on its hinge. He says, but I'd rather sleep a little bit more. You give him the food. You bring him breakfast in bed, right? You bring him the plate. He puts his hand in the plate. He doesn't want to feed himself. He doesn't want to put it in his mouth. Examples of how lazy could you get? I mean, they'll bring it to you. No. It's too difficult. It's too much. For whatever reason. Excuses for everything. No matter how easy it is, it's difficult for him. Now, even though this is a mashal, this, these are all examples that Shalom Melech is using to describe various stages or various forms of laziness, in real life, this exists, as I give you the example with the letter, that people 
show, demonstrate, display this kind of, of, uh, of behavior in, in various areas in their life. Okay, if this were to happen in sports, in going for a vacation, in going shopping, it's not the end of the world. If it's not done now, it's done tomorrow. So you, instead of eating cereal today, or you don't have milk, you'll have orange juice. I mean, there's ways to get around because of one's laziness, then he'll do with whatever he has. But when it comes to milay deshmaya, as the rabbis tell us, but when it comes to spiritual things, to Torah and mitzvot, it's very, very risky, this kind of an attitude, to push off a shiur, to push off uh, learning, to push off the performance of mitzvah, that is very risky for the neshama. That opportunity may never come back. The day that is gone is gone forever. Whatever you could have done on that day, in the spiritual sense, in mitzvot, how are you going to make up for it? So when it comes to spiritual uh, ma'asim, like mitzvot, it becomes even more imperative that a person be careful with this midah. Rabbis tell us that the one who's lazy will have a difficult time doing teshuvah, especially if he procrastinates, if he has that part, that type of laziness, procrastination, in pushing things off. He may never get a chance to do it. There's a midrash that says that Amisel was lazy to do teshuvah during the time of Yirmiyahu, and because of that, the temple was destroyed. And it, was, it was laziness that, that contributed to them not doing teshuvah. Had they not been lazy, they would have at least felt bad, felt sorry, and tried to make amends, tried to correct the situation. But it was laziness that brought about the destruction, unfortunately. Now I'm going to add just one little more detail, and this is really geared to the women. The rabbis are not picky. You know, when they talk about something, they have a reason for saying what they're saying. And laziness is something that applies equally to both men and women. It's not good, it's not healthy. But they did say that for a woman at home, a married woman to be lazy, is very, very destructive to the home. Much more than if the husband is, is lazy. Now that may sound a little bit surprising and maybe not fair. <laughs> the women may think, well, wait a minute, you know, it's not fair. The husband can't be, no, he can't be lazy either. But a woman who raises the children, who takes care of the kitchen, who does everything in the house, for her to neglect the home, it can easily lead to a problem, a problem with shalom bait, with the peace of home. It can easily lead to trouble. Husband, you know, is not uh, very energetic perhaps, doesn't get things done on time. It's a problem. It's, it could be a big issue too. But it will not affect the whole house in the same way. The mother, the wife being the, the one who's lazy, it, it just it affects a lot more. It is therefore much more serious, and therefore the women need to be extra careful in this particular area. But obviously it's, it's, it, this applies to the men too. Okay, now that I've given you a little bit of an overview of what we're talking about, of how serious this midai is, how destructive it is, and how uh, it could really make one uh, waste his life. It's a complete waste of life if he did not accomplish what he could have accomplished. Now we're going to dig into it a little bit more to try to understand what is it? What is it exactly? Why are people lazy? And then we'll go into the more complex part, how to actually deal with it. So what is laziness? In the simple sense, in the very simple sense, I spoke a little bit about it last week when we spoke about the opposite midah called zirizut. Zirizut, or as it's called in modern, modern Hebrew, haritzut, diligence, is the opposite. When someone is diligent, meaning he's energetic, he's proactive, he does things, he gets things done, he doesn't push off, he doesn't wait, he has sense of purpose, is clear about what he needs to do, and doesn't, doesn't slow down. Atzlut comes about as a result of a lack of stamina. There are four elements that we all have, that we're all comprise of. We have earth, water, fire, and air. And laziness is described as a lack of fire, 
as a lack of the element fire in a person. The more fire, the more element of fire is present in an individual, the more energetic he is. It sometimes is too much of a good thing. He becomes impulsive, too fast. He becomes quick to anger. Anger, all of that comes from a lot of fire. Tremendous amount of fire is no good. It burns. It, it's destructive. You don't want to have too much fire, but some people do. That's their tikkun. That's their challenge. That's what they need to work on. <coughs> Controlling themselves. Not being too impulsive. Always need to work on having a balance. But some people have more than others of a certain element. So atzlut in its pure, simple sense is a lack of fire. Lack of fire meaning a lack of stamina. But as you will see, there's all kinds of laziness and not all laziness comes from a lack of stamina. But to just briefly describe the symptom that, if, that everyone may have to a certain degree, it has to do with a, a lack of stamina. And we'll, we'll describe a little bit how to deal with that. Plus, when the laziness comes from exterior, external reasons, nothing to do with an internal weakness or lack of something, but for external reasons. If this laziness occurs once in a while, where we don't feel like doing something, where we want to rest a little bit, sleep an extra hour, if this happens once in a while, that's manageable. It's not something good. We should never be lazy. But it's manageable because what does it show? It shows that you're human, you know, that you have, you know, a desire, like I explained last week, for menucha, to rest a little bit, which is natural. All of this is tiv'i, as it's called in Hebrew. Completely normal and natural behavior for a person to once in a while, once in a while, pamper himself. I want to rest a little bit. I want a vacation. I don't want to work hard. Right? If it's occasional, it's fine. The problem begins when this is regular. When one sees on himself, or if others see it on him, that on almost on a daily basis, he's just not wanting to do things. He just doesn't get things done. He just procrastinates and pushes off things on a regular basis. Now, there's a light that goes on, a red light. If this is happening all the time, then there's a problem. We still have to figure out what the, the source of the problem is. Where is this laziness or procrastination coming from? Because we're not, we need to know how to deal with it. There's different reasons for it. But if it's regular, it's a problem. It's a real problem. There's an individual who simply works very hard. Very, very hard, physically, mentally. And he's tired. He comes home, he's very, very tired. As a result of the tiredness, he doesn't get things done. He falls asleep. Have you ever seen people by a sefer or a sidur closing their eyes? falling asleep, and they're not 75 years old, you know, people who are older, maybe young. Now, it's not sleep apnea, if that's what they call it. It's uh, tired, he's tired. <clears throat> he worked long hours, he was concentrated, his mind is tired, his body is tired. But the problem is, very nice, that you work so hard, and you, do, you definitely need a rest, but do you know that as a result of that tiredness, your whole night is it's gone. You won't be able to see your kids and your wife. You're going to go to bed early or just not go to a shiur because of that and not pray out of eat. So many things can happen as a result of that tiredness. Not your fault completely, but a hacham not verosho. One who's smart has to see all of this and say to himself, wait a minute, I'm losing out because of this. I'm overworking myself, becoming tired, and it's the tiredness I'm not lazy. It's the tiredness that is causing me not to do things or to push things off, either one. He has no strength. This is quite typical. And if this happens, it can be dealt with relatively easily. Just take care of yourself. Rest. Don't work so hard. Right? And perhaps do some exercise. Exercise is very good for the body, even though I'm talking about this and I haven't been doing it recently. But when I talk, I talk to myself too. 
whatever I'm saying, I'm saying to myself too. I'm not just preaching to others. So it is true. The Rambam speaks about it. Exercise is a good thing. Exercise is healthy. The right exercise is good for you. And here is, a, is an example of where exercise <coughs> and rest can actually help somebody who's pushing things off or not getting things done because he's tired. Quick fix. Quick fix, no problem whatsoever. Take care of it. Rest. Exercise. Then there are situations where there are physiological or psychological issues that are producing this kind of laziness. And this one you have to pay close attention to because unfortunately they exist and you may be able to identify one or more in somebody that you know and if you do they need help one of them is a lack of motivation lack of motivation he's not really lazy by nature he has fire in him he's an energetic person Especially at once upon a time, he was very energetic. What happened to him? What happened to Shmuel? What happened to Shimon? I remember he was very, very energetic. He got things done. Well, maybe he's not motivated anymore. Something is going on in his life, in his personal life, in his personality. Something's going on. Why would a person not be motivated? Find out. Now, we're not going to talk about why a person is not motivated. There's so many various reasons, but lack of motivation is definitely a, a, an issue. It's a problem. It could be dealt with. Find out what it is and see what, what could be done about it. Why is there a lack of motivation? He's not strong-willed. Now that could be part of his personality. He's not a strong-willed person. Or it could be that something happened and he's no longer, does not, is not as in the past as strong-willed. These, these individuals can be helped. They really can. It's not laziness in its pure sense, but it's still having similar consequences of delaying, procrastinating, and so forth, because it's not strong will. It could be a lack of self-confidence. Why don't you do it? Eh, I don't know if I can really do it. Lack of self-confidence, that's all it is. You may need a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of a push. That's the only reason why he's pushing things off, something that could easily be done. He has no problem. He's not a lazy person in the real sense, in the pure sense. He's just not confident enough that he can do something. Then you have all kinds of fears and anxieties, haradot, that people may have. They're unsure, they're certain phobias, or a very low self-esteem. That, that's another problem and sometimes even depression. Even though all of these have something in common, I mean, the person is, is pushing things off because of some problem that he has, other than laziness, it's still gonna bring about the same result, same consequences, and an, an unhealthy situation where because of something that is bothering him or that he has in his nature, he's not, being, he's not able to maximize his potential. He's not able to get himself a job. He's not able to sit and focus and con concentrate on his learning, uh, or whatever. These are, these are real issues, serious issues that can be dealt with. Then there's a situation where somebody overanalyzes a situation and gets into too many of the details and complicates matters even more than what it really is. It's a lot, sometimes the situation is a lot simpler, but people sometimes tend to make more than what it really is. And that is a certain characteristic that certain people have. As some people, as the saying goes, they can't see the forest for the trees. You know, and sometimes when it comes to a problem, solving a problem, dealing with a problem, they, they, they overanalyze it. And it's really not so complicated. And because of the overanalysis, they procrastinate. Then you have the perfectionist. It has to be done right, it has to be perfect. And because of perfectionism, things don't get done. And if they did it, they have to do it all over again. <laughs> you know, some people who are perfectionists, they've written something nice. You look at it, it's beautiful handwriting. They erase it, no, they gotta do it all over again. No, just put a little bit of white out on it. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't look nice. 
perfectionist is not always good to be a perfectionist. You won't get things done as quickly. You may, may eventually get it done, but not as quickly. Chaval. Then there is the, the individual who procrastinates for the following reason. This example that I'm about to give you, pay close attention because it may happen to all of you, this following one. Why do we procrastinate at times? Because we just got carried away by something else that drew our attention. Now, why did that thing draw our attention? Because what, what we're about to do, what we're supposed to be doing, is not something so pleasant, but we got to do it. And that which drew our attention is more pleasing. So the human nature tends to sometimes make an on-the-spot decision. I'll take care of that later and do this. It's nicer, more attractive, tastier, or whatever. And that happens to just about all of us. And that can happen to almost all the time. We get carried away. We don't even realize it. We're about to do something. We were, we were going to do it. But because it's not so pleasant, it's hard, it's not something we really enjoy doing, we'll push it off then go on to something else, which is not more important, if it is, than it is. But it's more pleasant, it's more pleasing, it's, it's easier. Okay, great, we'll go right back to what you were supposed to. No, but that won't happen. Because by the time you're ready to go back, you've got a phone call, it's late at night already. You got remember, you got carried away. Carried away. So a lot of the procrastination was because we got distracted. And why, do we get, why were we distracted? Because that was more pleasing. Be careful with that. Because if you allow yourself to do that, you're falling into a trap. Yes, procrastination is a trap. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a good thing. It doesn't say be a procrastinator anywhere. <laughs> it's not good. There are very few uh, occasions, very few examples of where one is allowed to delay. And we'll get to that later. But this is a trap that many people fall into. Because what they're about to do is not so pleasant. If you made a resolution, you made a decision to do it, then just do it. And in this way, you will be able to control that midah of procrastination. Just do it. Don't push it off. Unless there's some very, very good reason. Don't do it. Then there is a situation where there's a lot of tension. What's, t what's tension, exactly? you are bombarded or swamped with so many tasks and some people cannot handle a lot of tasks at one time. They just collapse. It's just too much pressure, tension. It's just it's too much for them. They can't handle it. So what do they do? So they tend, of course, to push it off. Hey, who asked you to do all this yourself? Lo alecha melecha ligmor, as it says in Perkebo. Who, you, don't, you don't have to finish everything. Get somebody to help you. But because he didn't think of that, look what happened. Instead of getting somebody to help, you know, delegating the work to others, he took it all himself, and it's too much for him. He starts pushing things off, perhaps even everything off. Forget it. It's too much for me. Well, why don't you just do one thing now? No, but I, they can't think like that. The whole thing is just too much, the whole package. Okay, let, I'm going to do it another time. You know, it's a long week and I have time to do, you know, think about it. And do, get it, get started. So that is a situation that arises sometimes when people take too much upon themselves. Then you have another procrastinator. This one can also be found amongst many, many people. Yeah, this is the shtuyot. This is something insignificant. It's a small thing. I'll take care of it uh, Tonight, because they minimize it, because it's really something trivial, they push it off. It, it may be that you, are, you, you can push it off, but it's not a good idea to get used to it. That's, that's, that's an additional point that I'm trying to bring out here. I'm not saying that you can never do that, but because people tend to do sometimes this, Pushing off the small things, the minor things, yeah, I'll, take, I'll deal with it later. You, we're getting used to pushing things off. You see? That's how it works. It, that, it, it, makes, it definitely affects us. Then there is a situation where we've embarked on a project that is 
too difficult for us to do. Just too difficult. Not the one I gave you before, where there's too many things. This is one thing, but it's too difficult for us to do. Don't. If you can't do it and you need help, get somebody else to help you. But we sometimes we give up or we push it off because we realize it's too much for us. Then there is the, the tasks that are scary. Some people are scared of doing certain things. Simply, you know, uh, scared or they don't want to take a chance. And because of that, they say, you know what, when I get around to it, when I'm, I'm calmer, when I don't have that much on my mind, I'll do it. Again, this is a situation which may occasionally happen to anyone. But if it happens regularly, that people put off things because they're scared or they don't, they're not confident of themselves, that's not good. It shows that this individual needs help. Now, laziness, if, if, it, if, it, goes not, if it does not go corrected, what it produces, besides loss of opportunity, it produces or it generates a continuous desire to rest and to take it easy. That's what they call it in this English, to take it easy. Now, taking it easy is not a problem itself, but the symptom called laziness, it generates this. It autom if you don't treat it, it automatically leads to that. It produces that. That those who have the smida automatically want to take easy. They want to take it easy. And besides taking it easy, the commentaries, I, I saw, not the commentaries, but the, the, those who deal with this issue have said from their experience that it also produces tardema. Tardema is sleepiness. People become sleepy. During the day, you've had your eight hours of sleep, then why are you tired all of a sudden? It's that nature called atzlut that has produced this. In other words, that during the middle of the day, you may just fall asleep, or you may just want to take a nap. You don't need it. You don't really need it. But because of that kind of, of activity, of that kind of demeanor, that kind of, uh, of, of behavior, of pushing things off, being lazy about it, it just tends to bring about the tardema. That's the way I saw brought down, someone who brings this down, that it has after effects. In other words, it leads to other things. And when that happens, what suffers, for a Jew at least, the kiyuma mitzvot and the limuda Torah. In other words, the kiyuma mitzvot may not go very well for him, the observance of mitzvot, the learning of the Torah. And even when he does learn, he may not even have the right ideas or the proper understanding of what he's learning because the mind has become lazy. The mind becoming lazy does not function, does not operate well. So you're seeing all these consequences as a result of not holding on to the reins of this midah, of not controlling it, of not, not, uh, not having the upper hand on it, but, but allowing it to just drag you through missed opportunities and through all these uh, kinds of situations where we, we lose control. So does everybody understand more or less what we're talking about now? The, what, what this symptom is all about? So we're all ready now to tackle it and what are we going to do about it? of the various facets of this midah called laziness. First, the first thing that we have to keep in mind is that the rabbis emphasize the importance of always being active. Liot pa'il. Rabbis tell us in very strong terms, Shabbatala mevi'a lidei she'amum. Lack of activity leads to boredom. Boredom. Boredom is not something good, not something healthy. But the word shiamum is not just boredom. That's really a word that we use in modern Hebrew. Boredom. Shiamim. When the rabbis used the word shiamum, they talked of, they meant something more serious, something very negative. The batala, lack of activity, could lead to sin. It could lead for, to a person losing his mind. Shiamum is a, a, is a form of losing a person's mind. Not, not going crazy completely, but almost. Doing wrong things as a result of batala. Doing silly things as a result of being not active. The rabbis even say something that I saw recently about how activity is healthy to those who are older. 
and they were thinking of retiring, don't stop working. If you stop working, you don't do anything, you, a husband of a person can die. In other words, work, continue to work, and today even the experts agree with that. Now, a Jew is always working somehow. He's always going to tefillah, so we don't have that risk, Chazun Shalom, just doing nothing. So you don't have to physically work till you're 90. You can stop, you can retire and spend more time learning, spend more time with your family. But always be active. So much so that the rabbis add the following point. If somebody is wealthy, and he can afford several maids, one that does the cleaning, one that helps with the cooking, one that... Uh, that uh, helps with the, with, the, with the house, with the various things that need to be done in the house. What is the wife going to do? The wife of a, of a wealthy magnet, that's, that's the way you call them, magnet, okay? a wealthy individual, what is she going to do? So the one opinion says, well, if she has all these maids, she's going to do nothing. She doesn't, she can sit in her throne, you know, in her big chair, and just do nothing, maybe read a book. And the Chachamim said no. The, the, the maskana, the conclusion of the, of the rabbis is that even if you have a hundred maids, never allow your wife, never allow yourself to be without some activity. Because it's going to drive her crazy. It's going to cause her to do things that are not right. It can lead somebody to sin. That meaning doing nothing, no activity, can be very destructive in ways that we did never anticipate it. So always be active. Act, be active, always be productive, always do something. Number two, to keep in mind, is that we have a Yetzer Ara. And this Yetzer Ara is called the Yetzer of Hesecha Da'at, the Yetzer of Distraction. The rabbis talk at length about what Hesecha Da'at is. Hesecha Da'at means don't be distracted when you're praying, Remember you, before who you're standing when you put on tefillin. Don't be distracted. Put the hand, then put the head. Don't talk in between. Don't have hesechadat when you're doing something holy, when you're performing a mitzvah. Be focused on it. Don't be distracted. When you're praying, don't think about your business. That's called hesechadat, not to be distracted. Hesechadat, unfortunately, is something that uh, can bring about a disconnecting a nituk, a severing of one's connection to reality. Reality. Why? Take the average person from the street. Do you think he's thinking about dying? Nobody wants to think about dying. People think they're going to live forever. Right? You ask somebody, oh, did you prepare your funeral? He says, what? Did you ever, did you ever see somebody preparing for his own funeral if he's healthy and young? The rabbis tell us to look forward to this. Yes, anticipate it. It's going to be coming one of these days. Yeah, they're going to bury you a few feet under the ground. They're going to cover you with shrouds and a talit. They're going to put you maybe in a casket if it's here, in the ground directly if it's in Israel. They're going to cover you with dirt. Yeah, after 120, Mizat Hashem. Think about this. We are actually encouraged to think about this. We're actually told to go to a house of mourning, because we are reminded by that. Otherwise, if you don't focus or think about these things, you're being distracted from reality. Which, what is the reality? That life is short and that we're headed to a more important place. This is just a hallway where we need to perform and do certain mitzvot to get our ticket to Olam Abba. That is the main, we're working towards that goal. So this life is not as significant in, in a sense, you know, was, this is not the goal. It's significant in what we do here. But this is not where we came. This is not where we're going to land and stay. After all, every human being who's been here before, before us, is gone. Has anybody seen George Washington recently? He's gone. He was the here. He's gone. Nobody from that time, neither his children or grandchildren, are around anymore. They're gone. And so will everybody eventually, I mean, whoever is around after some years, they're going to go. So that's the reality. The reality is that this is not forever. And that we're here for something, something very important. But the Yetzara tries to produce Hesechadat. Be distracted, enjoy life. Take care of yourself, pamper yourself, go for a massage. 
Swedish massage, I think they have. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Why not? But these things distract you. I didn't say it's not good for you, but they distract you. They, you know, they, this is not the ikara. So remember, as a Jew, remember, there's something called the sechadat that is produced by the Yetzirara, who wants to distract. That's his job. Don't focus on reality. So keep this in mind. If you keep this in mind, it's important to be active. Be careful with the sechadat. I'm going to focus as much as I can. It helps a little bit for a person to stay in the right track. And then number three. Number three is what the Rambam says. The Rambam means speaking about midot, about character. He says, listen, you have a characteristic. The only way you can deal with it properly is by going to the other extreme temporarily. You're, you're, if you have laziness, you're going to have to train yourself to be very, very diligent, the opposite, for a number of weeks and months, and then you're going to go back to the middle road. The middle road is not too much, not too much quickness, and not laziness at all, of course, but something in the middle. He speaks about stinginess, he speaks about anger, how to control these things. They're in us, if we have those characteristics. Go to the other extreme, he says. That's how you can, you know, what is he trying to say? What he's trying to say is to deal properly with any midah requires a lot of investment, and it requires a little bit to be extreme. You may need to do something extreme, and then, eventually, be normal. It may require us to do hard work for a short period of time and then go back to the middle road. Let me give you three ideas that I saw, that I read about, that would fit into more or less what the Rambam is saying. Let's say you have a problem with laziness. Okay, what can I do now, right now, that can help me based on what the Rambam told me? Something extreme. <clears throat> Do something you don't like, usually you don't enjoy, and do it right away. What's a good example? Washing your dishes. You have a whole bunch of dishes. I don't think most of you, I don't know, I, I'm imagining most of you don't like to do that. What? Go ahead, now, wash the dishes. You don't like it, you don't enjoy it, do it, and do it now. What are you doing? You're forcing yourself to do something you don't like, and you're doing it right away. So as soon as you see it, okay, I know I have this thing that I need to deal with called laziness or procrastinating. I'm going to train myself to deal with it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to choose something I don't like or enjoy and do it right away. <clears throat> Number two, let's say you come home from work and the first thing you do or the second thing you do is you go to the couch and you put your feet down and you rest for several hours. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it for a month. It's going to help. It's really going to help. You're used to resting. You're used to sitting or laying down on the couch for an hour or so. Don't do it. You're going to see what it does. Number three, and this one you can modify according to what your habits are. You like having coffee with sugar every day? Well, guess what? For the next two weeks, no coffee with sugar. Coffee without sugar. What does this do? It strengthens your will, your, 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 your discipline, your willpower, which I'm going to talk about soon. Some people's willpower is not strong enough, or it should be, right? Their discipline is definitely lacking. This kind of exercises, which is in the spirit of what the Rambam says, are forcing you to strengthen yourself, and eventually they can help you with the laziness. Right? It's, you're not attacking the laziness directly, you're attacking it from a different angle. You, you're allowing yourself to make quick decisions, important decisions that will help eventually motivate and then eventually strengthen and eventually discipline you. Just quick examples of what one can do right away to strengthen his willpower. I'm going to share with you now a whole bunch of additional ideas. Some of them will, will be probably more, uh, more shayach, more relevant than others. Some of them you may, you may decide for yourself if you think you need it or not. But I think the vast majority of what I'm about to list will be very, very helpful. This is for general laziness, for basic laziness. Number one. 
Try to find the detail that is holding you back. If you analyze your situation, say, wait a minute. Remember the guy that I told you about the envelope? What's going on? I wrote the letter. I put it in the envelope and I put a stamp. I found the address. Why am I not just going to the post office or to the mailbox? What detail is missing here? Analyze yourself. Because it's usually, a, it's usually, I'm telling you, most of the time it's a small detail that is preventing or holding him back. What is it? Is it perhaps that I always get carried away and do something else? Why don't you just take care of it? Do it right away. Find out what is the detail. And it's usually, remember, it's usually a small detail. If you think about it, you will find that it's a small detail that is holding you back from doing that, from taking that last step. Number two, think about the importance about what you're about to do. Is it very important to you? If it's important, think about it. This is very important. People get up early in the morning to catch a flight. It's important to them. They don't want to miss the flight. There are white other things that should be important you know, are, are pushed off. So think, if it's important, think about how important it is. Oh, this is important to me. And, be, and, be, and because of that, I need to take care of it. Or ask yourself, well, can I really ignore this? Will I really gain by pushing it off? Think about it. We don't always think enough about it, but think, is this something that I can really push off? I say, no, I'd rather not, then do it. <laughs> is this something that somebody can help you with? This takes us back to the other one, where there was a problem of taking something that's too difficult, too cumbersome. Ask yourself, wait a minute, perhaps this is something that I should not be doing on my own, and I should have some help. This way it will be done. Because if it's something that you really need help and you don't get the help, it's kaval. It may wait for a couple days, if not a couple weeks, just because of that. Think, wait a minute, perhaps this is something that should be done with help. Or perhaps there's another approach to getting this done. Perhaps another way. Because maybe the way you do it is not easy. Perhaps there's another way, another approach. Another idea. Why are things not always getting be, uh, done on time? Perhaps I am a perfectionist. Am I? You know, ask yourself. Maybe that's the problem. So you're asking yourself, interview yourself, analyze the situation. Is that the reason why I'm not, I'm not able to get it done? Why so many times I push it off? Is it because perhaps of perfectionism? Then you have an individual sometimes stuck. He's stuck in memories of the past, and that clogs his mind. He's about to do something, he's getting ready to do it, and all of a sudden he sits down and starts daydreaming, thinking about all kinds of things in the past, just dreaming. This kind of an individual, by the way, the best thing for him is to just get up and do something, anything, anything. As soon as he sees himself dreaming in fantasy land or whatever, or in memories of the past, Get up and just do something. Go take out the garbage. <laughs> something. Go take a walk. Get yourself out. Do something because otherwise you remain stuck and you want in wonderland. And memories of the past, just thinking about things. But that's taking your time. That happens too. So get up and do something right away. One of the most powerful ones for people who are very, very lazy and always tend to push off things, is making a decision. I'm going to make a decision, then I'm going to do it now. Once you've made the decision, you're halfway there. Believe it or not, having made the decision is very, very powerful. Because some people don't, haven't even gotten to the decision. Say, this is my, I made the decision. Made the decision, I'm going to do it now. Once you've made the decision, it's a lot easier. I'm not saying it's for sure going to be done. But it's a lot easier. It's halfway there. You are halfway almost there. So make a decision if it's something that you were, you've been thinking about. Yes, I'm going to do it. Once you've said that, you're ahead of the game. Sometimes what's advisable for people who have a hard time in just doing things that are, that are time consuming, divide it up in various parts. Okay, I'm going to do this part today, that part tomorrow. If you divide it up, it's more manageable. Then you will do part one, part two. If it's all 
staring you at the eye, got to do all this thing. Oh, no, I'm going to do it next week. I first have to do something. That's no good. Unless it's something that can really wait. You don't want to get used to that. Remember, we're trying to avoid this whole idea of ever, if almost ever, procrastinating, pushing things off. Then perhaps this might be a solution. If it's something that can be broken up into parts, you'll be able to manage it better. And one thing that is very much emphasized in, in the words of the rabbis is always take upon yourself one thing at a time. Tafasta merube, lo tafasta. Whenever you take upon yourself so many, a lot of people like to do everything, they want to take everything. And the person who's doing teshuvah may fall into this trap too. The Yetzirah tells them, oh, you got to keep Shabbat, you got to keep kosher, tarata mishpacha. Now you got to go pray nets, you got to put on tefillin and tzitzit and go tevilat kelim too. Ah. He's all excited. He's, yes, I'm going to do all of it. And be before you know it, he does zero. Not even one thing. Tafasta mirube, lo tafasta. Take one thing at a time. Shwaya shwaya, as they say in Arabic. One thing at a time. A little bit at a time. And that way, you'll be able to accomplish everything. Something that may help, which I haven't tried yet, but I saw it brought down, is tell it to yourself out loud. I want to do this. Say it out loud. I guess when you verbalize something and it's not just a thought, it gives more strength to it. And in the same way that, that the talich of teshuvah, the process of teshuvah involves admission of guilt or first feeling bad and remorseful and then verbalizing it by confession and then commitment, physically doing something. So we see that the verbalizing of the, of the sin, of the confession is important. So speaking about it, saying it out loud, perhaps will also give it more strength. After you've done something, be happy about it. Be happy about it and reward yourself. That's also something that I saw written down. Treat yourself, go do something as a result of having accomplished something. Because any time you reward yourself or you, you really feel good about it, it strengthens the motivation and the drive. We talked about it before. Some people may be lacking that. And here you see, wow, you proved it to yourself. You've just done it. You've gone. You've drove in there. You've driven there. You've, uh, you've done it. You've set it up, right, by yourself, right? Without any outside help, that means you've proven it. You can do it. Then you can do it tomorrow too. You can do it the next day. In other words, you see you can do it. So reward yourself. Maybe buy yourself a chocolate. I don't know. Something. <laughs> Whatever you like. You know. Feel good about it. And this good feeling and this reward will stimulate you further. The reason why being happy about even something small is important is because the success, the experts explain that the success of small tasks is the secret of the success of larger tasks. If you've succeeded in the small ones, that means you can succeed in the larger ones. So therefore, you've done it. You've done it, even though it's small, even though it's just once. Be happy about it because that in itself proves that you can eventually succeed in the larger tasks too. Anytime a person is happy with himself, it strengthens his self-confidence. So happiness, midat simcha, which was that Hashem will talk about, is not just a beautiful midat to always be happy and rejoice. Here we're talking about happy with yourself, with your accomplishment. There's a Hebrew word called sipuk, which is hard to translate in English, but it basically means satisfaction with what, you're, what you have done. The, another word which is similar, but a, a different idea, is called nahat. Having nahat from your kids, which is also a certain happiness and satisfaction that Baruch Hashem, they're doing the right thing, they're married, they're settled, they're, they're, they're working, they're, they're, they're righteous. That's called naha. It's a self, it's a sense of good feeling and happiness. When a person accomplishes something, you know how good feel. Imagine you have to organize your room. It's all a big mess. Anybody have, have that problem? They do, they won't tell you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's a balagan, as we call it in Hebrew. The garage or whatever. You know, you, know, you know how good it feels after you've done it? Oh, it's, a it's not just that the room is clean and organized. It's the accomplishment that you've done it. I actually did it. So therefore, having those small successes is very important.
because the small success is indicative that you can do it, it will strengthen you, it will motivate you, and it will give you the, the push to continue to succeed in the other tasks as well. Let's say you just finished a task. Another good idea that can help us strengthen ourselves, or whether it's the self-confidence, whether it's the, the will and the discipline, you just finished it, you know what? Try continuing. Even though you started off saying, that's all I'm going to do, try continuing. You know why? Anytime we stop, to come back to it later on is very difficult, especially if you wait a lot, a lot of time. If the interruption is big, it's harder to come back to it. So if you can, try to force yourself. If you can, after you finish, okay, I'm going to push on a little bit more into the second stage of this project. In this way, you won't give too much interruption between the various parts. One has to be very careful with yush. Yush means to give up hope. Sometimes situations arise that are very difficult, really, really tough, tough problems. Never say that it's impossible, never say it's too difficult. On the contrary, convince yourself, no, I can, it is possible. I've been involved recently with all kinds of situations, people who are having problems in Shalom Bayit, where people say there's no hope. Never say that. There is hope. We've got to do our best. We've got to try. Never use the words, there's no hope, it's too difficult. It's not good. <laughs> Don't give up right away. You've got to try, you've got to do your best. So, Lezat Hashem, I mean, hopefully, if we have the right attitude, we will never give up. Let's say you really have a problem with uh, laziness. You always rest and like to take things easy and slow. Another idea that may help is that even though you're tired, don't go to that sofa. Unless you say, I'm going to do it for 15 minutes only. Now, I know th this is not always, doesn't always work. I've sometimes asked my kids, you know, wake me up exactly in one hour from now. And sometimes I succeed, you know, one hour. I had a lot of work to be done, but sometimes, you know, you're so tired that that one hour becomes two hours. And before you know it, it's two o'clock in the morning, and now I'm getting up, you know. Well, what can you do? If you're really tired, you're tired. But be careful. If you are going to lay down, give yourself a time. If you don't give yourself a time, then it's very loose. Ah, an hour, two hours. Give yourself a time, and this way you have more control over the situation. It's a good idea to set up goals, long-term goals. The reason why long-term goals are good, even though they're long-term, is because it gives you something called in Hebrew tzipiya, something to look forward to. And that something to look forward to is also stimulant. It's also something helpful. This is what I want to accomplish. I'm not starting it now, but this is a long-term goal. These things are helpful too in dealing with the laziness. And now comes my favorite. Anybody want to guess? These are all good ideas, but the following is, I think, the one, of the, one of the best. It may not help every one of you, but it's definitely helpful. Make a list. Lists, yes, lists are very, very good. Keep a list, whether it's in your Palm Pilot or whether it's written down. And what's going to be on that list? The important things first and the less important things last. Because a list is not just a reminder of things to be done, it should be prioritized. Priorities are very important in life, because we spoke about esechadat before, being distracted, being distracted by things that should not distract us, things that are not as important. Make a list and a prioritized list of things that are more important on top, that need to be done right away, things that are less important now. If you have this list in front of you, I'm going to do this, I'm going to go check, check them out. You're going, to, you're going to feel very good about yourself when you've done completed your whole list. But put the things that are the most important on the top. A priority list is very important. Working and developing willpower and self-discipline is very important. It's something that goes on forever. It's not something that we can take care of right away. These are, these are exercises that will help us in life in many, many areas. Self-discipline and willpower. And by prioritizing your life, by organizing yourself, by being strong and by taking care of things in the right time, it brings that about too. 
I want to advise you that one of the things that you should be very, very careful, here you're, you're working on your, uh, motivating yourself, you're working on your discipline, and you, Baruch Hashem, you have a lot of willpower. I want to warn you that even though this is, this is good and this is fine, what can easily break you, what can easily make you lax and fail, are those small things that creep in in our lives that are unplanned. I'll give you an example. You started Baruch Hashem, you all motivated, you made a decision, you said it out loud, <laughs> you gave up your sugar and your coffee, you did everything right, right? And all of a sudden, you get a phone call. Okay, let me take the phone call. Be careful. If it's not your mother, <laughs> or, or your spouse, or your son, or, be careful, because that will distract you. That may be something which is not as important. But you think it is because it's a phone call, and you're used to taking phone calls. Or I, I just gave you an example. It doesn't have to be a phone call. It could be anything, little thing that comes, it creeps in. Oh, could you take care of this for me? Somebody asks you. Can you go into the? You, you're you're going down the block. Can you go to that house too? Okay. Or you say Hesed. It may it may distract you. You you have to get back on time. You have a shiur. You have this. Be very very careful. Somebody asks you to do something for him, and you want to, of course, do him a favor, but wait a minute. If this is going to take you off track, it's not good. Why? Because we always think it's going to take two minutes, and it always ends up taking a lot more. And when it ends up taking a lot more, guess what? You've missed your opportunity to do what you were supposed to do today. You push it to tomorrow, but tomorrow you can't do it because you have something else for tomorrow. You won't end up doing it so fast. So be careful. When you do organize yourself, you prioritize yourself, don't allow so easily for things to creep up. To creep in. The last thing that I want to mention to you is a very, very important idea that is also mentioned in Kohelet, a very important pasuk, chapter 9, and it deals with the question, okay, I have a lot to do in life. We have a lot to accomplish. How much should I do? Where, 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 should, where should I stop? Should I, I mean, how much should a person try and do? What should he do? There's unlimited amount of chesed that you can do. You can visit many sick people. You can every day, twice a day, for, for breakfast. And <laughs> how much should you do? You know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an easy question to answer, but I'm going to give you an idea. And that is what Kohela tells us. And this is a very important idea for life. In Pirkei Avot, we, we said before that You don't have to do everything, but neither are you exempt from doing nothing. So how much should you do? Very, very powerful statement made by Kohelet. As much as you can. Whatever you can do in life, if you're capable, do, do as much as you can. Because once you get to the grave, you won't be able to do it anymore. So while we're alive, do as much as you can. You have an opportunity to do something productive, something helpful, a mitzvah. Do it as much as you can. Whenever we have the ability to do something, do it. Whether that succeeds or not, that's up to Hashem. But we have to try. And if we try, we will have divine assistance. As the rabbis tell us, Kola bali taher Whoever wants to become pure, he will receive divine assistance. But they will only help you if you first help yourself. So you first have to want. We first have to make the decision to do it. We first have to recognize the importance, the value of what it is. We have to have clarity. We have to be careful with the Yitzhara, with the Sechadat, not to be distracted. We have to be focused. And we have to prioritize our time. What is really important in life and what's not so important. And by the way, this priority is not only important when it comes to spending money. What should I spend on and what should I not spend on? It's really very, very significant when it comes to the most precious commodity of all. And that's called time. What should I do with my time? And I'll end with a quick story. There was once that an individual that came to a big rabbi and asked him, Rabbi, I only have 15 minutes a day to learn Torah. What should I learn, Rabbi? Chumash, Gemara, Kabbalah, Halachot. There's a lot of things to learn. I only have 15 minutes, he says. The rabbi says, you have 15 minutes, learn Musar, Musar, ethics. Rabbi Musar of all things says, yes, when you learn Musar, you'll realize you have more than 15 minutes a day. <laughs> <laughs> okay? 
when a person sits down and analyzes his life and what's important and what's not important, he hopefully will realize that learning and working on himself is very, very important. His life will be transformed, his home will be different, he will be a happier person if he just organizes things right and prioritizes things right. And with the right hashkafa, with the right outlook, with the right outlook meaning with, with knowing what's really right and what's wrong, with knowing what's important and what's not, he won't make as many mistakes. But we still need hizukim from time to time. We need strength. We need to be strengthened. We need stimulants. We need uh, people to encourage us. We, we need all of that. We're only human. And that's why we're here. We're learning about what we can do and what we need to avoid, what we have to be careful. There are many traps and temptations out there. And they tend to take us away from the service of Hashem. So as, as Jews, we have a tremendous responsibility to, to be aware, to be cognizant of all these pitfalls. Because they, they destroy people's lives in all kinds of ways, not just in laziness, in being very, very angry, in being very not productive, in all kinds of ways. And we'll cover each one of those areas in each one of those Mebuzat Hashem throughout this year. But laziness is one of those midot, as Shlomo Melech pointed out to Mishlei, that really, really completely destroys a person's life. Because it's not necessarily the physical life, because even if he inherited millions of dollars and he doesn't have to work, if he's lazy, it's a shame. There's so much that he can do and be productive in, in being a, a decent human being, in helping people in so many other ways, even if he doesn't have to work. Learning and, and teaching, perhaps, so many things that you can do. This is definitely a midah that one has to conquer, has to work on. And Bezat Hashem, if we will make an effort, as I said before, we will see a tremendous amount of beracha because the Kadosh Baruch Hu will help us, Bezat Hashem, be able to conquer our Yetzirah and be able to, Zat Hashem, to control our Midot. Thank you. Hi. Um, you do. Yeah.